Hello there, welcome to Showcase. While cinemas are enjoying explosive sci-fi extravaganzas, Foundation has turned heads for bringing what media calls serialized prestige science fiction to the small screen. And now the series returns to further unfold its Byzantine saga. Rejoice, his shame remains unknown. But he had almost sat a throne. I don't know that poem. It's about an uprising. The new season of Foundation takes place a century after the previous finale. Now, in the galaxy living under the rule of the Empire, a queen bent on revenge plots to destroy it from the inside. I have dreams sometimes about things that will happen, and I wake up terrified. The creative minds involved say the show will add more intrigue new characters, and complex relationships into the mix. An empire breathes respect. It requires it for its life. The Foundation is a threat to me. And that is where Foundation distinguishes itself from its silver screen peers. A good number of blockbuster sci-fi films are considered B-movies with big budgets. Foundation, on the other hand, is based on the award-winning books of Isaac Asimov and instead aims to provoke thoughts. Over a hundred years ago, Harry Selden stood where you are now. He claimed he could establish a foundation to read the future and shorten a coming age of darkness. That makes sense, since at its core, the story is about a scientist. Hari, who uses mathematics to analyze the past and predict the future. We fight for peace. Shut up! Not because we fear we will lose. Showrunner David S. Goyer explains the new season will also delve into the organization Hari has established, Second Foundation. It's a university with an intelligence network and consists of psychologists and telepaths. We are taking the planet! Goyer says, in contrast to the books, we'll actually get to see how that group develops on screen. Had a reckoning. And that's another thing. With several volumes, the intergalactic epic features too many storylines. But Goyer plans to take his time with them across eight seasons and 80 episodes to do justice to the original material. It was always a leap of faith. That is ambitious, given the fact that some also find the show too confusing at times. But remember, the alternative is computer-generated, imagery-driven explosions at the multiplex. So the choice is up to the viewer. Now! In the name of the Father, Luke set the sectarian conflict in the United Kingdom when it was at its peak. Due to the, both its subject matter and its handling of it, the film attracted both acclaim and controversy upon release. And as Alijan notes in our movie Almanac, there's a timely aspect to its 30th anniversary. <laughs> In the Name of the Father is based on Jerry Conlin's story. He's an Irish youth, forced to confess to the 1974 Guilford pub bombings. Both him and his father are sent to prison even though neither were involved in the act. Looks like they're coming out of everywhere.
the story centers on their struggle to prove their innocence against the odds. The actual bomber, Joe, has confessed to the act, but that information is not shared with the public. It's only when other withheld evidence is investigated that the wrongfully accused are set free. Your father passed away an hour ago. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. The film is a critique of the justice system, but critics point out it also dons a character study quality in the way it examines the relationship between Jerry and his estranged father. Reviews say these aspects flourish through the performances of the actors and turn the film into a rousing drama with a humanist focus. And you've got 15, 15 years, years of blood and sweat and pain from my client, whose only crime was it wasn't, he was, he was bloody well Irish. Still, the movie did draw criticism for historic inaccuracies. One main example is that it wasn't Joe who committed the bombings. The IRA Bolcom street gang was responsible and admitted that on their trial. You were not charged with treason to the crown, a charge that carries a penalty of death by hanging. Scenes with Jerry's lawyer are also said to take a liberal approach to recorded events and actual courtroom protocol. To be silent or you will be removed from the court. Twenty twenty three not only marks the thirtieth anniversary of this controversial movie, but also the twenty fifth anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, which ended the conflict that the British called the Troubles. But incidentally, the new IRA announced in the new year that Ireland still remains under occupation and that it has rededicated itself to use all means to end British rule. And that statement lends both anniversaries another layer of importance. Each Pixar movie is eagerly awaited, not just for its artistry, but also its moral messages. And the company's latest feature, Elemental, delivers that message in a rather unusual but fitting way. Meet the residents of Element City. Air usually has their head in the clouds. Oh, my new jacket! In Elemental, people of fire, water, land and air all live together. Water is always getting into something. But due to their natural differences, there is prejudice within their society. And it's in this kind of atmosphere that a girl made of fire and a water-based boy strike up a friendship. But we all live by one simple rule. Elements cannot mix. They hang out in the city, learn about each other, and eventually work together to solve their problems. So you've never left Firetown? Sorry, buddy. Elements don't mix. Critics say using nature's elements to talk about such issues as diversity, setting aside differences, and self-discovery is a fresh take on these vital topics and that the film encourages viewers to be open-minded at a time when there is great cultural division. I see a change in you. What hair guy? I hope that when children watch this film, they take away a sense of themselves and that, you know, maybe some of the points that they're a bit insecure about in their life can actually be one of their biggest strengths. Like, you just never know, you know? And I hope it helps them, you know, bring them closer to their family or their chosen family or their loved ones. Live here? It's my mom's place. The film's message makes sense, especially today. 
where technology overrides many lives and causes isolation. It's very timely in the world today. It's, it's easy for us to actually just look at our phones and stay indoors and be in our homes and only talk to the people that you know. Whereas a lot of our adventures really is about discovering how other people live. How else can you understand how even though it looks like we're very different, we're going to probably understand that at the very base, we are mostly all alike. Try this. Dad, those are too hot. I love hot food. Elements may not be mixtures, but in the case of this Pixar film, the combination of fire and water not only do not cancel each other, but also point to a future of coexistence. And dialogue between them is all it takes. what I wanted to do. From transportation and finance to healthcare and design, it seems that the world is slowly falling into the hands of artificial intelligence. And as new research reveals, a growing number of young creatives are using AI to help make music. T. Peters is one of many young artists who now harness the power of artificial intelligence to make music. He uses AI not only to help mix and master songs, but also to create cover art and promotional materials. AI for me is uh, it's the perfect assistant for the times that we're in right now. I can use the AI tool to kind of help me kind of get generate ideas so that when I do get the money to invite my friends or invite other partners to help me, I can easily just show them what I did by myself and then they can add their own touch to what I've done. Youth Music surveyed nearly 3,000 musicians across the UK and found that 60% of them incorporate AI in their creative processes. The charity believes AI has hugely improved accessibility within the music industry. The AI is being used in an assistive way to help with press releases, writing lyrics, writing marketing copy, and to do all those things that somebody more privileged would be able to pay for. But young creatives doing it for themselves have found a way that AI can help them and really overcome the barriers that they face. But not everybody is on the same page. It's supposed to come from sort of the heart or the soul, or when, when you come up with a rhythm, it's supposed to be a flash of inspiration. If someone's doing it for you, or a machine is doing it for you, it's like, why am I making music in the first place? Although some musicians like Paul Martin are worried that AI will make music less special, those using AI say it's simply an eight and nothing more. The Tuscan town of Cortona is commemorating its most famous native, Italian Renaissance painter Luca Signorelli. An exhibition to mark 500 years since the artist's death shows how Signorelli paved the path for Renaissance masters like Raphael and Michelangelo. A new exhibition in his hometown Cortona calls Renaissance master Luca Signorelli the painter of light and poetry. 30 loans from many Italian and foreign museums have been brought together in an exhibition which curators call a unique overview of Signorelli's career. In this exhibition we present Luca Signorelli not as the last artist of the 15th century but the first artist of the 16th century. Somebody who should be ranked with Raphael and Michelangelo, both of whom drew inspiration from him, and someone whose mental capacity, whose ability as a colorist and as a sculptural painter paved the way for later artists. Now this was recognized by his contemporaries. It was recognized soon after his death by Vasari, his first biographer, but in the 19th and 20th centuries, his reputation diminished. It could be said that Signorelli started painting with contemporaries who simply got luckier when it comes to fame. There are a number of explanations for why Signorelli fell from immediate fame. 
we entered the era of the cult of Leonardo, where the Mona Lisa or the Gioconda in Paris became the world's most famous painting. Before that time, it was a much more even perception of the Renaissance, and certainly collectors in the 19th century bought Signorelli whenever they possibly could and tracked him down across central Italy. The challenge in this exhibition was to gather his works back in Cortona again after five centuries since his death. They had dispersed to as many as 12 countries and 80 collections across the world. Over the 60 years of his career, Signorelli had famous patrons such as Lorenzo de' Medici and Pope Julius II. He was an extraordinary innovator of his time, painting figures that tell stories laced with passion, pain, outrage and hope. Signorelli's art is marked by an extraordinary colorism by an intense awareness of form and particularly its sculptural potential, all done in two-dimensional painting. But lastly, by something that really marks him out from his contemporaries, which was his powers of visual imagination and invention. He would reread a traditional subject and give it a new emphasis. And this is seen throughout the works in this exhibition. Curators worked hard to bring Signorelli's art together, and the highlight of the exhibition is the Metallica altarpiece, or what's left of it. Undoubtedly, among the most important reconstructions in the exhibition is the Metallica altarpiece. This extraordinary work that has been lost since the 18th century because it was broken up into various fragments and sold. Today seven are known and for the first time we find all seven in an exhibition. Some are owned by public museums, others by private collectors. But it is an operation that from a scientific point of view can finally bring a lot of novelty. With dramatic use of light, chromatic richness and a profound mastery in the composition of scenes, it's easy to see how Signorelli's work inspired artists across generations. For ex-pro boxer George Foreman, it's not easy to tell your story, especially when you're a celebrity. But he did just that in his new biopic that allows audiences into the ups and downs of his turbulent life. Listen to me, George. You got a punch like I've never seen. Big George Foreman, the miraculous story of the once and future heavyweight champion of the world. That's the name of director George Tillman's biopic about the rise, fall and redemption of Foreman. To hurt. It follows him as a young, angry and misunderstood boy into his later years as a professional boxer. For Foreman, revealing these details about his life was no easy task. You've been a celebrity, you hide your life. Big gates fence around your home. Dog glasses, uh, dog screens in your car. You don't want to tell anyone something. But I had to reveal things. I had to reveal them. And it was scary. But uh, uh, Tillman did a great job of bringing them out. He really did. The film also delves into the spiritual awakening that led him to retire from boxing and pursue life as a Christian minister. And it also has the more controversial moments, such as when he held up an American flag after his first Olympic win in 1968. The same year, former athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised the Black Power salute during their medal ceremony. We thought he was dead. Like after his uh, fight with, you know, um, with Joe Frazier, you know, the party that they have, and we see George make a mistake at the party that changes his whole marriage. And then later when George make a mistake with the young man as a minister, he, we all make mistakes. And that's what this movie's about, is second chance. Once you accomplish something great, and then the next day, somebody can say something that can change your whole world. And that's what George felt. I thought I did something in the Olympics, 
And then all of a sudden, I get a backlash for that. That's that emotion that I wanted the audience to be able to feel. He's 26 and unstoppable. How can you beat that man? And it's the closest one could get a ringside seat to see the boxing legend in all his glory. Big George Foreman opens in theatres on April 28th. The National Frederick Chopin Institute in Warsaw has reopened after months of renovations. Among the items on display are the composer's manuscripts as well as his last piano. Here's more. This piano belonged to Frederick Chopin. Still perfectly in tune, it dates back to 1848. It's on display at Warsaw's National Frederick Chopin Institute, where some major changes were made to make the conditions right and the collection even more interesting. The main reason of this uh, refurbishment was to, uh, to create a, a good atmosphere, a good air condition uh, to, for, uh, for the originals, so for the original objects, because they are very sensitive and we've got to be very careful when we show them to the, uh, to the audience. And at the same time, we wanted to change some ideas of the exhibition itself, showing more of the originals. Letters Chopin wrote to his companion Georges Sand and some satirical drawings she made of him have been added to the old display of manuscripts of Chopin's music. More personal items and paintings of the composer by various artists are also among the new additions. Especially after the pandemic, we realized that people are overwhelmed, oversaturated with things that are not original. They had enough of it and they wanted more originals. They wanted to touch the real thing. They cannot touch the letters, obviously, but they can almost touch them. And that was the reason for change. Be original. And we are. The letters also give an insight into Chopin's literary talent and reveal he was a man of many skills. The letters which are on display here are the absolute originals, certified, verified by our experts, and these are the letters he wrote himself, and they are at the heart of our collection. They are, well, romantically very inspiring because when you read them you get very close to Chopin who was quite a literary man I have to say. He wrote in beautiful Polish and in a very imaginative way and then when you see his handwriting it makes you a bit like you know like going on a on a time vehicle. You feel transported to his age and to his drawing room. With more than 7,500 items on display, this is the world's largest collection of Chopin memorabilia, and the visit here does have the feel of a time travel. One of Germany's best-known artists is getting a permanent space in Berlin. The exhibition features dozens of work by Gerhard Richter, with pieces reflecting the country's Nazi past taken center stage. The Neue National Gallery presents Gerard Richter, 100 Works for Berlin. The highlight of this series are pictures secretly taken by Jewish prisoners inside the Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp. The entire oeuvre of Gerard Richter is characterized by a tension between figuration and abstraction. The central work in the exhibition is the Birkenau, which was created in 2014. Gerard Richter deals once again with the theme he dealt with throughout his entire creative period, namely the examination of the national socialist past and the Holocaust. The painting showing his uncle Rudy wearing a Nazi German military uniform is also poignant. While this one features his teenage aunt, who was later killed during Nazi euthanasia program. As for Richter, he escaped from the communist East Germany to Dusseldorf in West Germany in 1961, and around 10 years later, he became a globally known artist. 
Ich glaube, dass Gerhard Richter nicht nur für die Deutsche. I believe that Gerhard Richter is not only incredibly important for German art history, but also has a very important position for international arts and art history in general. That's because he spent his whole life dealing with the basic theme of painting. What can painting do? What are its limits? What possibilities does painting have? And I think that the exhibition makes that very clear. We can really show the whole variety of figurative works, abstract works, glass and mirror works in the exhibition. The museum worked closely with the artist to develop the wide-ranged show. And both sides hope that in the future, artists from various fields will find different ways to present Richter's art in ever new contexts. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adrist from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching and bye for now.